Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to SVAC Sunday service. I'm so glad that we get to worship our God together. And even though I really miss all of you, um, but I'm so glad that we can still be connected through uh, internet. Um, isn't it great that our God is not limited by space or by location, and we can worship Him from anywhere that we want? And as we approach、uh, Thanksgiving, let's count our blessings. Even though、uh, this year is full of challenges and difficulties and a lot of new adventures for many of us, but in the end, God is still good and He is still in control.、Uh, let's never stop giving Him thanks and giving Him praises. I'm going to read、um, a passage from Psalm, is Psalm 100. It's a psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth! Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanks, with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good. And his love endures forever; his faithfulness continues through all generations. And let's pray together. Oh, dear God,、uh, we want to praise you and thank you for being our God, for being our rock and salvation, and and someone that we can count on, Lord. And thank you that you're always the same. In the midst of chaos,、uh, challenges, and fears, uncertainties, Lord, that you are still God, and we can still find comfort and peace in you and your presence, Lord. And thank you that we are your people, and you love us and care for us to send your Son to die for us, Lord. Yeah. Help us to never overlook the great things that you do for us, the blessings that you shower upon us, Lord. Help us to remember that every good gifts come from you, Lord. And help us to have confidence in you, have confidence to center our lives around you, Lord. We lift up today's service to you. And、may you be praised, and may you be pleased with our offerings. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. My salvation, where Your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Alleluia! Praise and honor come to Thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son.
my salvation. Will your love pour out over me? Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor to Thee. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Will your love pour out over me? Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor to Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the song sets free, oh, his freeing deed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin had no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, he's free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love pour out over me. salvation where your love pour out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to thee see the stone is rolled away God be praised, He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love pour out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. salvations where your love pour out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to thee praise and honor to Ephesians 2, 8-9 For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The 
Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, what a Savior Isn't He Blood of Jesus Christ Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the word of the treasures you found Wait, wait. 
with ink. The ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made. Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above. Who drink the ocean dry? No cool the scroll, content the whole. Though stretched from sky to sky, O、oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels' song.
declare the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, you seize the victory.
So the Valley Line Church welcomes brother and sister to uh, once again worship with us uh, online, and we want to uh, just uh, thank you uh, for your participation. And uh, yesterday, once again, uh, we have uh, over twenty-five uh, brothers and sisters uh, come to serve together uh, to reach out to our community. And uh, beside the, the turkey that uh, we are actually giving out through city team, uh, we, uh, uh, we have already prepared uh, and a very short article that uh, we have shared with you. Uh, we thank the Lord for his provision. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, put four languages, uh, English, Chinese, and uh, <coughs> Spanish, and uh, Vietnamese, uh, and uh, we hand, it, hand this article uh, out to uh, the people who come to uh, parking lot. So continue to pray for these people. Uh, ask the Lord to uh, use a, a small thing like this, small thing that we have done, and put it in the Lord's hand to reach out to these people, and eventually to reach the goal, uh, ultimate goal is to uh, bring these people to uh, Christ. And once again, I want to uh, <coughs> ask you to continue to pray for the nominee committee as we uh, continue to uh, reach out to different uh, brothers and sisters uh, to serve in the board uh, for the next uh, two years. So we uh, uh, covered your prayers and uh, please continue to pray. And if you have any floor nomination, please uh, uh, give the name to me and we can put uh, those uh, nominations into consideration <clears throat> also. And you have heard this uh, many times. And uh, just a reminder, thank you for your uh, contribution, your donation. Uh, our goal is to uh, uh, give $20 worth of a toy uh, per child and to reach the 350 uh, children. Many of you have uh, given, and uh, we just want to say thank you. But please continue to, to give and remember this uh, ministry uh, in your prayers. The, uh, the face mask uh, production, uh, about 100 uh, masks has been uh, taken or signed up for. And I just want to ask you to continue to pray. Our goal is to uh, make 500. So if you uh, can do that, please uh, let us know. And we hope uh, before thank, uh, Christmas, we will be able to go to one of the uh, grocery store and uh, to hand it out and to reach out to more people so that uh, they will uh, receive uh, not just this uh, gift, this protection uh, from the mass, but also from our Lord. So this is our hope and prayer. And uh, as we uh, wrap up 2020, we want to uh, encourage you to uh, go onto our website before December 31st to uh, <coughs> sign up for this uh, prayer list so that uh, you'll continue uh, to receive the 2021 uh, uh, weekly prayer list so that you can continue to pray uh, for and with us. We do need your prayer. <coughs> so uh, please go and and, uh, sign up and uh, let's join our hearts together now as we uh, come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you once again for uh, today. Lord, we just want to uh, give you uh, thanks because you are good and we want to uh, ask you to continue to uh, watch over for us. And Father, I want to pray for our country. Uh, Lord, uh, as uh, we continue to uh, uh, look into this uh, election uh, uh, situation, I just pray that, Lord, you continue to uh, undertake the situation. And Father, I also want to pray uh, as the COVID-19 cases are on the rise, I just pray that, Lord, you continue to protect and watch over for us. I want to pray first and foremost for those uh, among us who are working in the front line, in the hospitals. Lord, I pray for the protection upon them. I pray that you watch over for them. And uh, Lord, there are many brothers and sisters who are dealing with a different kind of sickness. They have to be in and out of this uh, medical facility. Lord, I pray your protection upon them. I pray you watch over uh, for them. And Lord, I just want to commit all these brothers and sisters who are dealing with different kind of sickness to you. Lord, I pray your protection and I pray you continue to uh, be with them. And uh, Lord, uh, once again, <clears throat> we came to your throne uh, with uh, desperate needs uh, not too long ago. Lord, we thank you for answering our prayer. Lord, we thank you for this uh, uh, conversion uh, on the sickbed. Lord, may you continue to protect this uh, a, a young, a new uh, spiritual baby that, uh, that uh, he will continue to grow in you. And uh, Father, we just want to give thanks to you for you are good. And Father, as we uh, come together, uh, we want to... Uh, <clears throat> Bring before you the tithes and offering. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you set this apart and uh, use uh, this uh, to, to furtherance of your kingdom. And Father, we continue to uh, come before you and uh, we want to uh, listen to your word. May you continue to speak to us. And Lord, we continue to ask you to be with us. 
uh, especially in this uh, uh, Thanksgiving uh, uh, time, just pray that Lord, you continue to help us to come a blessing. And Lord, thank you once again for listening to our prayers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to English service. Uh, today, we have a relatively large task ahead of us, which is to look again at the first 20 chapters of Exodus. This is all the material that we have been covering for the last few months uh, in the theme of deliverance, right? this uh, sermon series that we've been experiencing together. Uh, and as we look at the story of Exodus, right, think about the story of how God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. Reading the story and understanding it really requires us to know the context of Genesis. Genesis, as we look back, of course, we, we all know that Genesis begins with creation. God created a good world, an orderly world, and he filled it with creatures and it was very good. And in that creation, God created man and woman. He created the people, humankind, with the intention that they would be his partners. Right? God gave the man and woman the calling to help him, right? to help him care for all of creation, uh, to be stewards of the land and to help to make it fruitful. But then people rejected God's calling to partnership, right? They rebelled against God. Instead of obeying God's rule, they were determined to ha rule themselves, determined for themselves what was good and what was evil. But this betrayal did not end God's plan right, or God's desire to form partnership with humankind. Instead, God formed a new plan, a longer plan to call a people to be partners with him out of the sinful and rebellious humankind. Now, this plan had to be longer than the first one because people, remember, had already rejected God's rule. They had sinned against God. And so before they could be God's people, these people had to be redeemed. Now, the first step in this long plan was to find one family, uh, one family out of all the earth who would listen to God's promise and would believe and then would, would obey God, right? would start to act as God's partners. And God found this family in Abraham and Sarah. And to them, God gave his promise. He said to them, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now this nation that God promised to form out of Abraham and Sarah, that nation would become the people of God. Right, those would be the people that God would call into partnership with himself. And then that's where Genesis ended. Right, in Genesis, we saw Abraham and then his son Isaac and then his son Jacob each inherit this promise in turn. But the promise itself was not fulfilled in the book of Genesis. Right, Genesis ended with that, that promise still unfulfilled. And the reason is that God could not deliver on the promise right away. Because as we saw, humankind had rebelled against him and they, their hearts were desiring evil or desiring to rule themselves. And so before this family, before they could become the people of God, they also, they would have to be redeemed. They needed to learn who God was, and they needed to be taught to obey God's word. And ultimately they needed to be freed from that rebellious spirit. And so in order to do that, God sent this family into slavery 
for 400 years. And that's the context of Exodus. Our Exodus picks up 400 years after the end of Genesis. And during that time, the people of Israel, the, the family of Abraham and Sarah have been slaves in the land of Egypt. And they have suffered terribly under the taskmasters of the Egyptians. And they have been oppressed cruelly. But now after 400 years, God is finally ready to fulfill his promise. And in order to do that, he first must call a new partner to himself. And this partner was the man, Moses. And God called Moses by appearing to him on, a mount, on the mountain called Horeb and appearing to him in the form of a burning bush. And in this encounter, God gave Moses this crucial information. God said to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. God revealed that he was the God who had spoken long ago to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And now he was speaking to Moses with the purpose to free the people. Right? After these 400 years, God had heard their outcry, their, their cry for mercy, and he was now going to deliver them from slavery. We might ask, why now and not sooner? Right? Why is now the time after 400 years? Well, the, the text doesn't say directly, it doesn't say explicitly why God waited this long. But it makes sense to me, and I think the, the implication is that Israel's time of slavery was part of God's plan, that those 400 years were necessary. And in fact, he actually told Abraham long ago that this was going to happen. Way back in Genesis 15, the Lord said to Abraham, know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs and shall be slaves there. And they shall be oppressed for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. So even in Abraham's time, where God knew that he was going to lead Israel through this time of slavery. And it was necessary because Israel needed to learn. The reason it was necessary was that rebellious spirit of humankind, right? That spirit that caused humanity to reject God's rule at the beginning, it was still there. And so in order to teach Israel to, uh, to obey God and to appreciate the power of God and to see that God, they needed God, they had to go through this very difficult time of slavery. Israel needed to learn to depend on God and to obey him. And the experience of God's deliverance will teach them that. And so that's why now after 400 years, God is, calls Moses and is ready to lead Israel through the experience of his deliverance. Now, if we remember this experience of deliverance, it was a very powerful experience an amazing experience. Right, God didn't free Israel all at once. He freed Israel through that series of 10 plagues, through those miraculous wonders that God inflicted upon Egypt. And that was also intentional, right? That was also part of God's plan. Through those plagues, Israel was being taught a lesson and so was Egypt 
right? And so was the whole world. God was teaching the world who he was, that there was no power like his, that there was no authority on earth that could challenge him, that he was God and no one, and there was no one like him in the land. God described this to Moses in that first encounter. He said, I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. And after that, he will let you go. These wonders, these plagues, with them, God would humble Pharaoh's pride, and then he would also use them to give Israel a name and an identity as his own people. Now, we spent a long time uh, going through the 10 plagues. We, We preached on each of them in turn, looking at what God was saying and how God was communicating to Pharaoh and to Egypt and also to Israel. And what we saw is that in those 10 plagues, God unleashed upon Egypt the same power that he used in creation. Back in Genesis, God used his power to create order out of chaos, right? To turn the nothingness and the formlessness of the void into orderly creation, into land and sea, sky and, uh, and earth, uh, you know, uh, And there was a place in that world for all of God's creatures to live in peace and harmony. But now God unleashed that power on Egypt to uncreate the world. In other words, he turned the the order and power of Egypt, which was the most powerful empire of that time. God unleashed chaotic destruction upon Egypt. We saw in those plagues how God turned the water into blood, right? The water that God initially uh, controlled and formed into seas and lakes in the, in the order of creation. Now God turned to blood so that it no longer sustained life, but was instead deadly. And then God turned the sun into darkness, right? The sun that God created to order and rule the day Now God hid behind a darkness so thick that it could be felt. And then God unleashed the living creatures upon the land, right? The creatures that were designed or had been intended to live on the land peacefully and harmoniously and to be sustained by the land. Now they overwhelmed and consumed the land. The locusts, the the, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, they they filled Egypt and destroyed uh, the, the produce of the land. And the purpose of these plagues, as we said, was not to destroy Egypt, but it was to educate. It was to teach a lesson. Or if God wanted to destroy Egypt, he could have done so uh, with one, with a word, right? With one thought. But God didn't do that. Instead, he wanted to teach. He said this in Exodus 9, verse 16, through Moses, God was addressing Pharaoh. He said, this is why I have let you live, to show you my power and to make my name resound through all the earth. God was teaching Egypt a lesson. And Egypt, in this case, was was a representative for all of the rebellious powers of the earth. In in sinning against God, humanity declared their, their independence from God, had declared that they would no longer follow God, but would have their own way. And all of these authorities that had been raised up on earth, they were they were raised with, with that spirit of rebellion, that desire to not obey God, but to rule themselves. And so to all of these rebellious powers, God was teaching the same lesson through the plagues that there's no one like him. 
There's no power like his, and there is no authority that can resist him. His name is great in all the earth, and there is no one who can match him. Now, Israel also need to learn this. Right? If Israel had become a nation and not learned this lesson, they probably would have become just as rebellious as all the other nations of the, of the world. But for them to be God's people, right? for them to be a holy nation, they had to learn that, they, that their identity was one that, that was submitted to God, that they were God's obedient servants, that God was the one who ruled them. And their most important calling was to listen and follow God. And the experience of, God, of deliverance we taught them that. And that lesson was taught even more powerfully through the final plague, uh, the plague of the firstborn. And more specifically through the Passover that God instituted to save Israel from that plague. Remember, God instructed Israel to, uh, that each household should take a lamb that was spotless and unblemished and that they should sacrifice that lamb and its blood should be painted or spread on the, the doorposts of each household. And that when God saw the blood, he would pass over that house. We read in Exodus, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so that Passover was a powerful uh, sign of God's grace, right? That God was not going to strike down his own people, but instead he was doing this to free his people. Right? Through the Passover, through the blood of the Passover lamb, each family of Israel knew that they were saved and delivered by God. But the Passover went beyond that. It was not just that one time uh, that it, it was not meant to be celebrated just that one time and then forgotten. No, instead, God actually told Israel that it would be something they should do again and again. He said, this day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Right? God intended that Israel would celebrate the Passover every year of their life. That, that they would, again, sacrifice the lamb, that they would eat, that they would eat it together in remembrance of God, that they would recite again the story that they were slaves in Egypt until God rescued them. And every time they did that, they would remember who they were, that they were not a nation like the other nations, but they were a nation set apart. They were God's own people, freed by his grace and power. And shared meals right, can have a, a powerful effect on us. They can remind us of who we are, remind us of experiences that we had in the past, and they can really take us out of the, the fear and the pressures that we experience in the present day. I had an experience like this recently uh, with my mom. Uh, I've shared with, many of you, with, with uh, you guys in the church that my mom uh, recently was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then this past month, she moved from Michigan to Northern California so that she could be with me and my brother and, and we could help care for her during uh, the long treatment that she faces ahead of her. And it's been a very stressful time for our family, uh, quite worrying, quite fearful as we think about what is ahead uh, for my mom. Uh, the other day I, I went to pick up my mom from the hospital from one of her appointments. And, you know, that, that experience of picking her up from the hospital, it was, you know, it was very, uh, it, it brought upon, it, br it brought upon us again, that, that weight of worry and fear as we, you know, as we are not sure what 
is ahead. And, and so uh, as I drove her home, I would drove her back to my brother's place where she is staying. You know, I, I was consumed by those thoughts, right? Those thoughts were very much in our, in our thought, in our minds, wondering what was ahead, right? Wondering um, what, what, what my mom was going to be facing uh, in her treatment. Well, when we got to my brother's house, my mom asked me if I had eaten lunch yet and I hadn't. And so she said, why don't you come in and I, I'll make you lunch. And at first I didn't want to, you know, I was really in a hurry to get back home, to get back to work. But then it, it was, seemed so important to my mom that, that, that she could, uh, that I eat lunch. Of course, you know, you know, that's the way parents are. They want you to, they want to make sure you've eaten. And so I decided, I finally decided to go in and, and, uh, and, and eat what my mom prepared for me. And so as I sat at the counter at the kitchen and then I watched my mom cook, she, she just prepared a very simple egg sandwich. And so as, I was, as I was watching her cook the egg, uh, I had the very powerful experience of being transported uh, back to my home where we grew up, back to that kitchen and remembering all the times that my mom had, had cooked for me and fed me through my life. And in that, sense of being transported all of a sudden that that worry and that fear that had been weighing us down it seemed to recede and and it was replaced by the stronger understanding of this this history that my mom and I shared of all the love that she had put into my life and all the times that we had been together and I was just so thankful suddenly I was just so thankful that my mom was here uh, in this area with us and that we were able to share these moments together and yeah, just thankful for our life together. And, you know, meals can do that. When we, when we get together and we, we share that experience and that memory, it can take us out of the present moment and remind us of what's really important, remind us of the bigger things that define our lives. Uh, that's why so many families this week will be, American families will be give, gathering together and eating turkey and giving thanks. Perhaps that ritual will be a, a respite for these fam- for many of our many families uh, to get away from the, the pressure and the fear of the pandemic and just to, to give thanks. I remember of the, the, the stronger and more powerful things that sustain their lives. Uh, and then, uh, it's also why we as a church celebrate communion right, each month as we eat the, the bread and drink the cup, remember who we are, right? that we're not defined by our fear, we're not defined by, our, um, by the pressures of the present day, we're defined by the grace of Jesus. And I'm sure Israel felt something like that. Right? Every time they had the Passover and they ate the lamb and they, they they, they re- rehearsed the story. They remembered that they were the people of God. And so that was the gift that God was giving Israel through this experience of deliverance. From that the point on, they would no longer be defined as a nation that, that formed themselves, right? They weren't formed by their own will, their own desire to be a nation. No, their origin was in the grace of God who rescued them from Egypt. Well, the story of deliverance that began with God meeting Moses on the mountain, it concludes with a second meeting on that same mountain. Right after Israel escapes Egypt through the sea, Moses leads them back to the mountain, right? Where he first met God and there God meets them again. Only this time, the purpose of the meeting is for Israel to become God's partner, right? To be for Israel to be called into covenant relationship with God. After this meeting on the mountain, Israel will be God's people and he will be their God forever. Now it's sometimes said that the purpose of this meeting was to give the law to Israel, but I don't agree. I don't think that was the ultimate purpose of the meeting. Of course, the law was important, but the law was not the, 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 the ultimate reason, right? The ultimate reason was to form this partnership. And the law was given as a kind of seal upon that partnership. It was given 
to help Israel live out their responsibilities to God, to, to live, live as God's people. And, but first, right before the law was given, God invited Israel into covenant partnership. He said to Israel through Moses, now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Right? God gave them this vocation to be a priestly kingdom. In other words, they would be like, priests for the whole world, that out of all the nations of the earth, they alone were given God's law. They were given the calling to live out God's holy ways. And as they did so, they would be a light to all the other nations, or they would be a witness to the, the uniqueness, the holiness of their God. And they would show the greatness of God's name throughout the whole earth. And that's who they would be if they lived out this covenant with God. And so that's the story of Israel's deliverance. It began with an ancient promise to Abraham and Sarah, and then it ended in this fulfillment on the mountain with their descendants. And now moving forward, they would become the nation that God had promised the people of God. Well, what about us today? You know, we as the church, we are encouraged by scripture to see this story of Exodus as not just Israel's story, but also our own story. Scripture teaches us that Exodus is not just a salvation story. It is the salvation story. In the New Testament, Exodus is put forward as also the church's story. And we're meant to see in the story of Exodus, the pattern or the, the meaning and the purpose of our own salvation. Right, that God by saving us is now also calling us to be his people, is calling us to be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. We find this among other places in the, in the writings of the apostle Peter, he writes in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I wanted us to see these two texts together so that we could see how, how similar they are, how clearly Peter is echoing the words of God in Exodus. We are now God's people as well as Israel. And we have been called to proclaim the mighty works of God, to, to live out the ways of God as a witness to the nations. And so it's right for us now to look back at the Exodus and claim this as our own and to see that God has delivered us in the same way with his mighty power and with that power, he has humbled the rebellious forces of the world. He's humbled all the powers that would seek to, uh, to defy him. And ultimately he has even defeated the power of death itself in order to free us and make us his people. And so as we remember that, let us joyfully live out our calling to be God's people. Let's not be afraid of any power or authority that would tell us not to do that <laughs> or that we don't have the ability or that we don't have the right to be God's people, but let us joyfully together live out our calling that we belong to God. He is our God and we are his people now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this calling, for this grace that we have received through Jesus, that we are your people saved by your grace and given your holy calling 
to, to be free, right? to live as a witness to all the peoples of the earth, that you are the living God, that Jesus is your son. And through him, you've opened a new way, a new and living way uh, to belong to you, uh, to, be, to have life in you. Lord, help us to be free of the rebellion and distortions and sins of the world. Instead, Lord, help us to live in joyful obedience to your word and know that in you, every promise is true and that your word to us is always yes and amen. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's respond to the word we've heard with this song response. Fish 
Amen. And as we conclude our service day, let us sing together uh, the doxology. Today we've heard a word that we are God's people and that we belong to him. And God has deployed all his power, his strength, and his glory to free us from sin, to free us from that rebellious spirit that has plagued humankind from the beginning. And in Jesus, we are free. Let's live out that identity together. Now let's receive the blessing. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. On behalf of Silicon Valley Alliance Church, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's a prayer that you've heard a word of encouragement and a word that grants you peace. Please uh, visit our website to download uh, the outline for the sermon, also some reflection questions. We invite you to further consider this word that we've heard and, and your identity as, God's, God's, as, as a member of God's people. May the peace of Christ be with you.